present your word. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, that we do pray. Amen. 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 You know, memory is a very important capacity that God has given us. Just think about how much we rely on it for things we have learned and experienced. Just think about how frustrating it is when we can't remember something. Like this guy who shares a story. When I went to lunch today, I noticed an old man sitting on a park bench sobbing his eyes out. I stopped and asked him what was wrong. He told me I have a 20-year-old wife, 22-year-old wife at home. She rubs my back every morning and then gets up and makes me canned pancakes, sausage, fresh fruit, and freshly ground coffee. I continued, well, well, why are you crying? He added, she makes me homemade soup for lunch and my favorite biscuits, cleans the house, and then watches sports TV with me for the rest of the afternoon. I said, well, why are you crying? He said, for dinner, she makes me a gourmet meal with wine and my favorite dessert, and then we cuddle until the small hours. I inquired, well, then, why in the world are you crying? He replied, I can't remember where I live. <laughs> in the Bible... Uh, we see many examples of things uh, done to help people remember God and the things that He has done. Consider, for instance, Jesus' words surrounding communion, which we participated in last week. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And how fitting it is that we would remember Jesus, right? In terms of, I mean, think that we would even, could even forget what He sacrificed on the cross for us. But it's even even fitting to, for Jesus to use a small portion of the Passover celebration to basically communicate his message of sacrifice, what he would do on the cross, how he would be the sacrificial lamb. And basically, we saw last week in the book of Numbers, chapter 9, that's where we are, Numbers chapter 9, the people of Israel are celebrating their first Passover out of Egypt. I think it's important to consider how special that must have been for them. I mean, think about the first Passover. Really, the first Passover was the event itself. In other words, they were in a hurry. They were sacrificing the lamb. They were putting, putting blood on the doorposts and realizing the angel of death was passing over their houses, not killing their firstborn, and ultimately killing the firstborn of those without blood on their doorposts. The next day, they were leaving the place that they were enslaved for hundreds of years. Many generations of Jews enslaved in Egypt, punished cruelly, used in terms of service. And now they're free to, to follow Moses, to follow God to their promised land. Now ultimately, again, when you think about the first Passover being the event itself, just imagine what the... Well, again, because ultimately, when you think about... What, what concern was involved in that, what work was involved with that, was fr frustration, what hope, all the things. Now all of a sudden think of being around Sinai, being in the presence of God, and now you get to celebrate that. I mean, think about all the things that are fresh in their minds. Oh, remember when we dropped that cart and we were rushing out, or those Egyptians gave us all their goods and all their gold and jewels, and we went through the Red Sea, and remember how God provided... All those different things that they would be able to memorialize and think about. Again, I think it's just important for us, particularly as we think of familiarity. As we think about familiarity in our lives toward the things that God has done, it's important to think about how excited they were in that first celebration of it. I think it's also important to consider the elements emphasized in the Passover that are also important for us. The first one was be in a hurry. You know, when it comes to their celebrations, we're going to read Action chapter 9. It's going to say, make sure you follow all the rules and regulations of the Passover. Well, one of the regulations is, put yourself in a hurry. Make sure you're carrying your staff. Make sure you're eating with your sandals on. Make sure your tunic is tucked into your belt. Because the point is, tomorrow you're leaving. Like, this is about not where you are, but where you're going and where God is taking you. And basically, we have to be aware that sometimes God's plan is that sudden. That sometimes God is on the move in a moment, and we need to be ready to get there with Him. Take that train that He's on. And again, something that's important for us. I think the second thing that the Passover emphasizes is power. I mean, ultimately, this was the completion of ten plagues, powerful ways that God revealed himself as the true God. When we were going through the book of Exodus, we actually saw that each of the plagues, in some ways, addressed Egypt's gods. 
The things they worship, the things they prioritize, and God showing, I'm the master of that. I'm better than that. I'm bigger than that. And so basically, the God of Israel showing his power in the contents of, society, of a society that did not know him, and basically the Jews being able to say, I'm on his side. I'm his people. He is for us. And so therefore, a lot of power expressed in the context of the Passover. A third thing that would be emphasized for them, well, naturally, God's power is for us. That, that's expressed. That's how powerful God is for us as well. But the third thing that is emphasized in the Passover, besides you're in a hurry, besides the power of God, is sacrifice that buys protection. I mean, ultimately, when you think about that lamb being sacrificed, when you think about the substitu substitutionary nature of that sacrifice, of all the sacrifices the Jews would participate in, in terms of sin, to have it so palatable, to have it be so real, in terms of this lamb is giving up his life so my firstborn can live. And again, when it's right there before you, that sacrifice is real. That sacrifice, again, that's not a distant thing. That's not something I'm not... No, they're experiencing the sacrificial nature of, that, of what is given by that lamb. And how much more so for us when we think about Jesus. When we think about the sacrifice that brings protection for us. I mean, the testimony of the word of God is that Jesus hung on a cross and all the sin of all the world, yours and mine, throughout time, was placed on his physical body. He was separated from God for three hours, dealing with that sin, basically bearing on his self and in his soul the punishment that we deserve. He was the atonement. He was the substitute. He took our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God of God. And so therefore we know that sacrifice. We know the substitution that he made. Now death that has no power over us because of what Jesus did. But again, how realistic and practical it was for those Israelites going through the Passover. I think the fourth thing that the Passover emphasized is freedom from slavery. You know, when you think about, again, the, 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 the practical expression of that in the Jewish, Jewish people's life. See, they're experiencing practically, which we then receive spiritually. But also, when you think about being, on the, being in the work uh, party, be, being, being on the line where you're building a pyramid, or moving stone, or doing something for the sake of the Pharaoh, or whatever it would be, in terms of what they did as slaves, being controlled, being beaten, being in the midst of suffering. And then God come along and say, I'm changing your destiny. I'm pointing you in a different direction. You're not going to be slaves to those people anymore. I mean, we in America, in some ways, might know freedom better than other parts of the world. I think we've misused it and it's turned to a bad thing. But in terms of us understanding the nature of freedom and the desire that, you know, I would have to follow my course and do what I want in terms of you not restricting me or not, not even controlled because of the class I'm in or where I'm born or what I look well like, that, that nothing that, the only thing that restricts me is my capacity to gain something and pursue something. Well, in God's economy, when we talk about His freedom, it's us fulfilling the capacity that He has destined for us. The purpose He's provided for us. The fact that we're not slaves to sin anymore. See, that's the freedom of, for, from slavery that we have as believers. But again, when you think about the Passover, you think about the practical expression of, again, these Jews going from a state of physical slavery to a state of physical freedom... That's a lesson for us as well in terms of what God accomplishes on our behalf. The fifth thing that Passover emphasized is community. That we are in this together. That as I'm celebrating in my house with my family putting the blood on the door, my neighbors are doing the same thing. And, you know, uh, Joseph is doing this over here and Solomon's doing over here. And you know, Isaac is doing it over there in terms, you know, that of all the people in Israel just in it together. And that's also an expression, that's also a part of our lives. You know, the communal nature of living out the Christian life. I think this, time, this thing we're doing, trying to do with the Word of God, this thing that we're trying to do with prayer, really is trying to help us recognize we're in this together. 
Not only in terms of the service we'll do, the works we perform, the ministries we might attain to, but in the process of living the Christian life. And then the relations we have, and my, my faith encouraging your faith, and your faith encouraging my faith, and building ourselves up in godliness, and righteousness, and purity, and truth, and kindness, and mercy, and love. Because those things don't come to us naturally. Those are things that God needs to produce in us, but God gives all of us for that. And as you struggle with something, and I struggle with something, we don't struggle deeper into the pit. We struggle out of the pit because of the power of God. But again, the emphasis of community that is part of the Passover. So those are the things that are really going through the Jews' minds as they celebrate this Passover in chapter 9. And if you're not already there, I, I wonder, I do wonder what things we could put in our lives to remember God's work in our lives. Like, I'm not sure how long you've, worked, you've walked with God. I'm not sure how long you've prayed to God, how you've been in His Word, or trying to live out the Christian life, or have a need, or, or have a, a miracle you're asking God for. But basically what I observe about God is that there are times where God is very present. There are times where God is very powerful. And, and you know He's working. Like this is something God is accomplishing, and I just get the privilege of observing it and joining in. Then there's other times in our lives where we might call them dry times, where God doesn't seem to be very present. Or I'm praying, and I'm knocking on the door, and I'm trying to get Him to, to, to do something, move Him in terms of a direction I want. And it doesn't seem, nothing seems to be happening. And what I believe in terms of the reasons why God celebrate the Passover, build an altar over there, put those rocks over here, is that when you see that, you remember when God isn't powerful when in your experience, you remember a time that He was powerful to help you in a time that He doesn't seem to be powerful. But just understand that God is always powerful. God is always doing something. We just might not see that. So I wonder, just taking the example of what we have here in the Old Testament of how God put things in the Israelites' life on purpose. Celebrate this so you remember that. And what could we do for that? Well, how could we memorialize things? How could we make a thing of ceremony in your individual life, in your family, or even in this church where, again, we recognize what God has done, that God has moved in a significant way. Now let's honor Him in terms of what we do and then uh, cause it to be something that we remember as well. You know, another, another thing that we have to understand about the Passover, a big part of the Passover was communicating that information to future generations. That the next generation, the children, will know that this is what God did. So hopefully by now, you read Numbers 9. And so let me just read the first uh, five verses here. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses in the desert of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they came out of Egypt. He said, Have the Israelites celebrate the Passover at the appointed time. Celebrated at the appointed time at twilight on the 14th day of the month in accordance with all its rules and regulations. So Moses told the Israelites to celebrate the Passover and they did so in the desert of Sinai. At twilight on the 14th day of the first month, the Israelites did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. So again, don't miss the fact that God is being very specific about what he's communicating in, in terms of what, what, what needs to happen, how this needs to go, and, the, and ultimately what is reflected here is the Israelites are being obedient. But ultimately, when you think about just what is communicating, communicated here in, of the, in terms of the order of things, of what has happened in Israel at this point, let me tell you what's happening. This is on the first day of the first month of the second year. Do you get that? First day of the first month in the second year, okay? So they're a year away from uh, Egypt, and now it's the first day of the first month. On that day, Moses set up the tabernacle. On that day and the next 11 days, each of the 12 tribes brought their gifts and sacrifices to the tabernacle. So basically what that does is that, that covers the first 12 days of this first month in the second year. Then on the 13th day, 
The Levites were sanctified. The Levites were purified. They, they went through a ritualistic cleaning in terms of their hair and their, on their bodies and shaving and cleaning themselves and cleaning their clothes and bringing sacrifices. So these Levites that were basically a redemption for the firstborn, you have to go back a couple of messages to understand what I'm talking about if you don't already. But anyways, the Levites are sanctified for service to the priests and to God in the tabernacle. That's the 13th day. Now on the 14th day of the first month, the Passover happens. Alright? That's the first month. Now, if you go back to Numbers chapter 1, you realize in the second month of the second year, that's when the census had happened. Like, all that information on Numbers 1 through 6 was in the second month. I don't know why they did it backwards, but, you know, whatever they were prioritizing in terms of the order of the camp and the registering of the fighting men or whatever... That happened in the second month, okay, in the, in the first day and then beyond. But now we're, like I said, we're in the first month, and that's the order that we happen in terms of where the Passover happened. But now there's some issues in terms of people who, who can't celebrate the Passover because they're ritually unclean. And so let's look at this interaction in verses 6 uh, through 9 here. It says, but, 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 but some of them could not celebrate the Passover on that day because they were ceremonially unclean on account of a dead body. So they came to Moses and Aaron that same day and said to Moses, we have become unclean because of a dead body, but why should we be kept from presenting the Lord's offering with the other Israelites at the appointed time? Moses answered them and says, wait until I find out what the Lord commands concerning you. Uh, so, so basically, you know, what we have learned throughout our study of the whole, whole uh, Leviticus as well as in the book of Numbers, seeing these issues that came up that really presented issues of public health, where the, where the Israelites were directed, when you, if you're around a dead body, you have to leave the camp for a time, make sure you're clean, present yourself to the priest, then you can come back. Well, if that happens in the midst of Passover, the day before the Passover, the three days before the Passover, you wouldn't be able to participate in it because you're unclean. Now, I'm not sure if I should make too much about what they say here and how they say it. I mean, ultimately, I appreciate their commitment. I appreciate their passion, their connection to community, the fact that, hey, I feel like I'm out and I want to be in. I want to be participating with this. But I'm not sure if you see a bit of hubris here. A little demandingness, but why should we be kept from? You know, why? Maybe what I see is like kind of the American attitude here. Like, wait a minute, I got my rights, and I have a right to do that, and you're not going to tell me I can't. And you know, so that's just not the way we engage with God. Like, we we, we come before God and say, God, is this okay? Like, I realize I'm operating in, a, in 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 an exception, and so if you say that I can't, then it's fine. But I don't come in a demanding way like, wait a minute, I'm going to do this and you better not tell me no. And maybe you don't see that. I might be seeing something you don't. So let's, let's move on. But just, just realize, I think there's more of a request orientation that they can have in this. But Moses ultimately does the right thing. He, he says, let me see what God thinks. The Passover was God's idea. So, so let's see what he thinks. And let, look at what God says. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, when any of you or your descendants are unclean because of a dead body... Or away on a journey, they may still celebrate the Lord's Passover. They are to celebrate it on the 14th day of the second month of twilight. They are to eat the lamb together with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They must not leave any of it till morning or break any of its bones. When they, when they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. But if a man who is ceremonially clean and not on a journey fails to celebrate the Passover, that person must be cut off from his people because he did not present the Lord's offering at the appointed time. That man will bear the consequences of his sin. An alien living among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must do so in accordance with its rules and regulations. You must have the same regulations for the alien and the native born. <laughs> And so do you see how dedicated God is to this being done right? That's what I hear here. I, I love the fact that he makes an exception. In other words, you know, realize if you're doing something or something is involved in your life that you're not responsible for, like you can't control if someone dies in your family and now you're, you're around a dead body in your house. So therefore you just do it the, the next month, but on the same day. You follow the same regulations. In other words, I'm not softening or changing what you do or how you do it, but just maybe the when can change. But certainly that doesn't give anyone an excuse 
If you can participate, you have to. I mean, you see that communal emphasis? This has to be all in. There has, this has to be everyone together. I would love that I could say that to you. You better do it or not. I, I'm joking, kind of. But anyway, um, but, but the, again, God wants to make sure that everyone is involved, all hands on, on, on board in terms of what he's doing. You're making a provision for the alien, those, those that would be outside of the people of God, that uh, God would want to welcome into the community of Israel. You know, we have to remember that God's intent for choosing Israel was not to seclude other people, but rather to use Israel as a witness, as a testimony to the God that He is, so that when other nations observe Israel and see their God and the way that He's working through them, they can then say, we want Him. So when an alien comes around, someone that's not an Israelite by birth, but says, I want that. I want that power. I want that sacrifice. I want that community. I want that hurry. All the lessons that, the, that we talked about in terms of the Passover, again, welcome them in. And it's almost unfortunate that I'm not going to be able to get through all of verses 15 through uh, 23, because it's a great passage of Scripture. And so I'm kind of rushing my comments about the other verses so I can at least get to this. And it says, On the day the tabernacle, uh, the tent of the meeting was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle, the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at His command, they encamped. As long as a cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes a cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp, and then at His command, they would set out. Sometimes a cloud stayed only from evening till morning, and when it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in the camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command, they encamped. And at the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with His command through Moses. You know, what a, what a great picture of the Christian life. What a, what a great picture ultimately about what God is calling us to. But really the first thing that I feel like there's emphasis here is presence. Basically, God is with you. That, 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 that God amidst, amongst this community that I'm calling you to, and, and hopefully you're rich by, I am part of that. My presence is here. You know, I think when we think about our lives, and we think about the things that we do go through, the trials and the suffering and the sin and the temptation that we're trying to grow out of and from, and you know, may, may, maybe things aren't working so well in our lives. Something we can always rely on is God's presence. Something we can always rely on is that God is with us. Basically, Jesus has promised, Lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. So if there's nothing else that gives you hope in the circumstance you're in, realize that God is with you. And that's the message of the cloud, that in the cloud is God, and so therefore the Shekinah glory of God, residing with the people of Israel, emphasizing His presence with them. I think the second thing that is emphasized here is wisdom and direction. I mean, think about why it would be a day, or why it would be a month. You know, um, maybe they just need rest, or maybe they don't need rest. Maybe God perceives weather. Uh, maybe God is sensitive to the seasons. You don't travel during the season. You travel during this season. Boy, there's a there's a monsoon coming or a wind or dirt. What's that sand thing? The dead thing. A sandstorm coming, and so I'm going to protect you from that. I mean, I can be looking at your enemies and realizing, hey, you know something? In three months, this king that's really influential over that mar that army is going to die. So why don't you hang here three months? Let him die, so they won't be as formidable. A, 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 um, uh, 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 enemy to you. I, uh, just think about the things that, that could go into why it's the, the different time frames. But who better to be directing that? Who better to be leading the charge and determining when you go 
than God in terms of him being able to think of all the contingencies, all the things that would need to happen. You know, I've always said that it would be great to camp with God. Because, you know, you think about all the things you pack your car with when you're camping. All the contingencies. Well, what if it rains? What if it's cold? What if this happens? What if we get sun? What if God would say, you know, you don't need the rain gear. No, don't bring the fishing pole. It's going to be lousy. You know, that, that, that God would be able to foresee everything that we would... Com- so, you don't have to worry about contingency with God. That, you know something, if He moves, I move. He doesn't move, I don't move. And what a great place, a great position to be in. At least in this context, what we see from the Israelites is complete obedience. I mean, think about the surrender that is involved. The faith that is involved. I mean, wouldn't it be nice, and wouldn't you think as an Israelite, you might say, you know, boy, the cloud lifted, it came back, you know, we're moving and we're staying. God, can you tell me how long this stay is? Is this a two-month stay, or is it a two-day stay, is it a year stay? God doesn't say that, does he? He says, no, you look at that cloud, you look at that fire, if it moves, you move. Otherwise, you don't move. See, basically what I see is that the, the Israelites' lives were constrained by that, Right? In other words, there are certain things you're not going to do if this is a two-day stay as opposed to a year stay. And because it could be two days, you're not going to do anything consistent with a year stay. Right? Like, we're not setting forms. We're not building a foundation. We're not connected to this world. We don't care about the environment. Oh, this is a nice place to stay. Let's build a house. No, we are on the move. We are mobile. We are under God's direction. And we are obedient when He moves. And so therefore, when you think about the picture of faith and obedience that, is, that exists there in terms of them orienting their lives to God and then allowing their understanding of who they are, their understanding of what they do being based on what God does. I think it is a great picture of the Christian life. Obedience, faith, surrender, lack of attachment to the things of the world. I mean, this is not our home either. That we should hold very lightly to the things that we would call our own, or our property, or I need this, or I want this. You know, if those things are outside of what God wants, or what God provides, you don't want it, and you don't need it. Because again, if you're a cloud person, if you're oriented to God's direction, if again, you're seeking a life where God, you say it, and if you move, I move, and if you don't, you don't. See, I, I see a lot of... A lot of analogy to the Christian life where, you know, there's an aspect of our Christian life that is just about us living out Christ. It's just me being obedient, me taking opportunity to to pray or witness or work, you know, all the spend time with my family, raise my kids, all these common things we do that, again, whatever your hand finds to do, we do it to the glory of God. But then, you know, something, sometimes God just moves and he says, you're going. And see, that's what the Israelite life was like. Like if God, if the, if the, the, the cloud isn't moving, they're, they're doing what they can for food. They're collecting their manna. They're, they're raising their kids. They're playing games. They're having recreation. They're studying the Bible. They're making their... They're just living out their lives before God. But then, boom, when the cloud moves, now, now your life is different, any, 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 isn't it? And so therefore, I, I see that as being very much the tenor and tone of our lives as well. Let me just say this, that this is the mindset that makes the Christian life work. When you say goes, what you say goes, when you say move, I move, what you say goes, goes. To whatever extent I am holding on to something that is opposed to God's purpose, I am limiting God's power to work in my life. See, the minute I have a mentality that, hey, you know, I'm not going to go when the cloud moves. That God says I should do this, eh, I'm not going to do that. See, to the extent you do that, you are limiting God's power in your life. You're limiting His capacity to move and to mature and to grow you and to use you in the context of His kingdom. And what I would say is, don't be content with that. Don't say, but my life is pretty good. I'm healthy. I have material things. I've got the American dream. Things are kind of working out well. That's not what you're here for. 
You are here for an intent and a direction of saying, God, I'm oriented to the cloud. I'm oriented to you moving. And again, I'm not going to hold on to anything that is not consistent with what you have provided or you have guided me into. You know, when we think about all that God desires, has instructed, has revealed, the two things that God is asking us for is He's asking for faith and will. Faith and will. The faith to believe and the will to, to obey. That, that, that's the two dynamics that we need to focus on in terms of just how much am I believing. When God says something, when, des when God describes me, describes him, describes rules, describes relationship, describes my conduct, do I believe that? Do I believe it to be true? Do I believe it to be the absolute thing I should do all the time in terms of orienting myself to what the Word says? And if the Word has balance, then I operate in that balance. And I look for the discernment and wisdom of the Spirit to operate in that balance. But also my orientation is to God. In faith, I believe it. So when God says, don't worry, don't worry. When, when, when God says, trust, I trust. When God says, obey, obey, like, 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 don't, don't, don't lust, don't be prideful, don't be materialistic. And, and what I, like, I believe that. I believe that's not the way to go because I believe the word. But then it goes beyond believing to now obeying because now the opportunity comes where, you, oh yeah, I believe this about God. I believe it about the standard. I believe about what I should do. But now do I have the will to do it? Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Faith and obedience, faith and will is what God is asking us for. Now, I know what you are thinking about. You wish you had a cloud. How many people are thinking that? I wish I had a cloud. Wouldn't that be nice? Hey, <laughs> you know something? God, just rest over the person I'm supposed to witness to. And if, they, if the cloud isn't over that person, maybe rain on them too, so I see some evidence of the cloud. No, no, no. But, but, we would, but you know what we have to think about? What we have to think about is what is better? A cloud up above or the Holy Spirit within. It. And you know something, ultimately, it's better to have capacity inside me than outside of me, right? See, now, what is difficult? What's the challenge? Well, we'll end there. We'll, we'll end here. The challenge is the cloud is easier. See, I can observe the cloud. There are aspects of me that can participate in the cloud. That I don't have to be particularly godly or spiritual. The cloud's moving. My heart's away from God, but I see the cloud moving. So, okay, I'm willing to believe because I realize God is powerful and good. And I'm gonna... See, there's an aspect of a disconnect that can happen following a cloud. There cannot be a disconnect when it's the Spirit. See, the Spirit needs to be uh, cultivated inside me. The Spirit is a process. It's not something instantaneous. Oh, the cloud's moving. It's going. But is the Spirit moving? Boy, I, my, my, my hope for me, for you, for us, is we grow in that capacity to recognize that God has infused us with His Spirit, with a capacity, I believe, to have this kind of relationship. Because you know, if, he, if He had it with the Jews, with a cloud that's outside of them, He wouldn't have it for us in terms of the Spirit. Where again, when God's on the move, see, a lot of times, like I said, the Holy Spirit is just and generating the fruit of the Spirit, just guiding you in your regular life in terms of doing the things the Bible would call you to do. But then, boom, something special. Boom, the Spirit's on the move. Boom, there's service. Boom, there's witness. Boom, there's obedience. And, and I'm there. And that, that, that's, that's a picture that I think Numbers presents to us in terms of the kind of relationship God desires of us. And it just really is a matter of, are you willing to come along? Are you willing to believe? And are, willing, are you willing to choose? Are you willing to have the will to obey? Because that's the only, that is the only thing that will keep you back. It's not intellect. It's not ability. It's not education. It's not family. It's not wealth. It's nothing will keep you from what God has for you if you're willing to participate with faith and will. Let's bow and let's pray. Father, we just do come before you and just ask that you, you, you bring the, 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 the measure of instruction and, and conviction that, that each person is ready for in terms of what you're communicating to us.
Father, there is a, there's a seriousness of what you call us. And, and Numbers really illuminates this in terms of the kind of surrender that is involved in being open to move when you move. I just pray that this would not just be a message. This would not just be something that happens on February 19th. But, but it's something that stirs something in our hearts in terms of what kind of people we seek to be. Oriented to you, oriented to the cloud, oriented to the spirit in terms of what you're directing us in. And so, Father, I just pray for all of us as we walk through that process and become more and more like your son Jesus along the way. Father, I do pray for anyone here that doesn't know Jesus in a personal way. That they've never come to that place of understanding the cross and the sacrifice and the blood and the forgiveness that was necessary. The righteousness that we need to approach you. And so, Father, I just pray for anyone here that has never taken that step to believe in Jesus, that they would believe that today would be the day of salvation. They would recognize your drawing on them, your conviction in terms of who Jesus is and what faith you're calling them to. Father, I just pray that they would, would answer the call, that they would say, yes, I want to believe. Yes, I want that salvation and the implications that comes to my life. And so, Father, I just pray for anyone that may be not ready to take that step, but they would just continue to search, and they would take your, your, your promise as, as word, that those who seek for me will find me, if you seek for me with all your heart. And so, Father, just use your word today to just, just continue to uh, invigorate our Christian lives. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, that we do pray. Amen. Amen.